Good evening. Good to be here with you again. Once more, I want to express my appreciation for your invitation to come and to be with you in this series, and I hope that you've been encouraged so far, and uh, trust that if you have been, you'll continue to be encouraged as you see these things this evening. On the way over here, I was telling my wife, this is my favorite lesson out of the whole series. I love this one the most. Because this is the one where we find out where did they get all this stuff from. They've been telling us about creation. They've been telling us about Adam and Eve. They've been telling us about the sin in the garden. They know about Cain and Abel. They know about Noah. They know about the flood. They know about the Tower of Babel, as we'll talk about tonight. And they tell us how they know all that stuff. And so I'm excited to share that with you this evening. Thus far, we've seen about 85 characters that agree in precise detail with the record of Genesis 1 through 9. Again, I want to emphasize to you, these images appeared in the Chinese language approximately 750 years before Moses started writing the book of Genesis. This is a separate account. This is an independent account. It has nothing to do with Genesis except that it records the same events. And so let's go through a review as we've done each time. I think it's important to get them in front of you so that you can uh, continue to see these and have them in your mind. And so we'll start with the image for create. Remember, this is specifically about Adam. God made Adam a walking and talking man. He was not an infant. He was a full-grown man, able to walk, able to talk. But the image for talk tells us that he was a living dust man. That's Genesis 2 and verse 7 being recorded inside that image. We have the image for pain or <laughs> sorrow. This was in Genesis chapter 3 as God spoke to the woman after they had sinned in the garden, after they'd eaten of the fruit that God said do not eat. The woman's punishment would be that she would have pain in childbearing. And so inside this image we have the two trees. There's a reminder of why she's going to have pain. She took of the tree that God said do not eat of. There were two special trees in the garden. God gave a command of one of those. But then the latter part of the image, under man, there's a reminder of where she was supposed to be. She was supposed to submit herself to her husband's authority, and she stepped out from his authority and listened to Satan instead. Here's the image for sorrow. When God addressed the man, he was going to have to work. And he was going to work through those thorns and thistles that we read about. The punishment for man's sin would be that he would work through these ancient weeds. That's what this uh, image for sorrow conveys. The word ancient shows the number ten in a mouth, likely him feeding himself from among these ancient weeds. Remember, we've talked about the images for beginning. These three can be used interchangeably if you're writing in Chinese. Uh, but they're very different in their etymology, three different beginnings. The first one is creation, just simply two people. The second one is the beginning of sin. We've got the woman secretly putting something into her mouth. And then the third one, the beginning of atonement. The left side of the image is the word for clothing. The right side of the image is a knife. They had clothed themselves with fig leaves, but that wasn't sufficient. They needed atonement, and so there were two animals that were sacrificed for them. The image for clothing means to cover up two people. The second person is coming out of the side of the first. This is Adam and Eve that are being clothed here. We had noticed this image for naked. Take one of those, if we just put one on the board, it would just mean light or bright. It doesn't have anything to do with the person at all. Put two of them together, and you have the word naked. You can put two light bulbs together as many times as you want to. Nobody's going to describe that as naked. These are now two people, two radiant people. This is Adam and Eve before the sin in the garden. But then we noticed a, a few other images for naked, and this is the one that we focused in on in particular. But remember, all three of the other images on the right-hand side show fruit. How do they know that they're naked? Because they ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God had said they should not eat. This particular one, you'll notice it's the same image on the left side, as it was in the beginning. So we've got covering up two people. And so inside the image for naked, we have uh, the idea that they needed to be covered up as well. 
We've looked at two images for happiness. The top one is Adam while he was in the garden, before it was sin. Left side of both characters is the same. The left side is an image for God. You can't have happiness apart from God. The right side of the upper image here is one man in the garden. This is Adam while he was with God in the garden. After the sin took place, we don't have access to the garden. We're not in Eden. So how do we find happiness? Again, we need to have God in our lives. The right-hand side of the lower image is a sheep. It's dependent upon sacrifice. For you and I, that would be the Lamb of God. That would be Jesus Christ. For them, it would be the animal sacrifices, the sin offerings that they were to give. Here's the image for ship. What it pictures is eight people in a boat. That's Noah, Mrs. Noah, Ham, Sham, and Japheth, and Mrs. Ham, Sham, and Japheth. There's a few different ways that this image is written, and I, I've put a different one up on the board here just to show you. I think the one you've got on your flyer has the top of that uh, covered over, which actually means several, but again, as I mentioned last night, I've talked to several older Chinese people and asked them, what is that? And it is the number eight. It's not supposed to read several. And so here is a better image to convey it. Again, it, it's not changed very much, but enough to show that this is now the number eight rather than the word several. But eight people in a boat is a ship. That is Noah and his family. We looked at this image for a flood. Flood is total water. The word total pictures what would be left over after the flood. And so inside the image for total, we've got these eight people together on the earth. And then we saw the word for sacrifice. There's a few different words for sacrifice. This one seems to be Noah after he gets out of the ark. While he's in the ark, he cannot make sacrifice. You don't set a fire inside of a boat that's made of wood. And so he had to wait. He waited over a year to be able to make sacrifice, but when he comes out of the ark, that is the first thing he does. What he does is he offers flesh again to God according to his commandment. And so those are the, the images we'll look at so far as a review. I do want to revisit something we talked about on Sunday morning. Remember Sunday morning we had talked about how the, the Chinese language has three different forms to it, three general forms of writing. There was ancient Chinese, which was from 2200 B.C. through to about 600 A.D., we have traditional, which began in 600 A.D. and went through to about the 1950s. And then we have the simplified form of Chinese, which is from 1950 until the present day. As I mentioned, that I'd love to do this series in ancient if it were possible. Uh, I don't have the kind of credentials needed to go look at that stuff that's sitting in museum basements and so forth. And so we're working in the traditional form. Fortunately, the traditional form maintains the etymology. The images are different. And so these three images we have here uh, are each of those forms, ancient, traditional, and simplified. It's the word righteousness each time. And I want to demonstrate to you that the etymology is intact. We looked at these images but didn't look at the, the etymology of them on Sunday morning. And so let's take a moment to do that. And so remember we noted in, in lesson three that righteousness pictures a sheep covering over me. That, that's what righteousness is. Well, if we look into the ancient form, it shows the same thing. The images are different. I understand it's written different, but that is a sheep in the ancient form, and that is me in the ancient form. And so the etymology is intact. Now remember the word me in the traditional form is a hand and a knife. We go back to the ancient form, and the word me is comprised of a hand and a knife. And so though the writing style differs, and in fact when you go back to the ancient, there's a number of different writing styles in the ancient, but the etymology remains the same. And so it is when we come forward to the traditional. Now, we look at the etymology of the simplified. Again, this is the image for righteousness in the simplified. What it's done is in the traditional, there are 14 strokes inside the, the traditional. That's a very complex image to draw. And so to simplify it for their people, again, because of the illiteracy rate, they dropped it down to three strokes. That, that's easy. But now what it means in the etymology is control dot. That's nonsense. It doesn't mean anything. 
And that's why we need to work in the traditional form, because the traditional form still has the link to the ancient form. Okay, let's move on to some new material. Genesis chapter 10 is primarily a record of genealogy. And then we have the division of nations being described to us. And then we come to chapter 11 in the Genesis account. And we see what caused the division of the nations and uh, of the languages. And it's because folks were doing contrary to what God had, had commanded. In chapter 11, at verse 3 and 4, it says, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. They said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. And so contrary to the commandment of God, God had told them to go and to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Contrary to that, they all stayed there in the land of Shinar, and they sought to build this tower that would eventually be called the Tower of Babel. Here is the Chinese image for a tower. What the image shows when we look at the component parts in it is first of all it tells us the things that they were making their bricks out of. They have dust or soil and grass and they're mixing it I'm sure with water and so forth. And then it tells us about the unified effort as all these people, all these men had one mouth or one voice. They were speaking the same language, they understood one another, uh, they had one mouth. Now the word for tower has in its etymology a few other significant words to this building project. And so if we will remove the image for dirt or soil from the left hand side, you get the image for undertake. This was a huge undertaking that they were trying to do. They wanted to build a tower which had a top in the heavens. That's a big undertaking. If we take the weed off of the top of it, then you get the word united. Of course, they were united in this. They didn't want to be scattered abroad. They didn't want to be here and there. They wanted to stay in that one place and be together. And so the people were united in mind as well as speech as they undertook this building of the tower. This image for united, if we'll take the image for mouth or man off the bottom of it, we have the word together. And so they did this together. They were focused and working together. The ancient Chinese people were very diligent when putting this image together to depict the unity of these people working on the tower. Not only is it a tower, but it is a huge undertaking that showed their unity and their togetherness. They were focused on getting this done. In Genesis 11, at verse 6, it says, And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Here is the Chinese word for confusion. One of them. There's a few different words that would be used for confusion. This one seems to be about what took place here in Genesis chapter 11 at Babel because what it pictures for us is a tongue mystery. At one moment they understand what each other is saying and at the next moment because God confused their languages there is now confusion. What kind of confusion? It's a tongue mystery. I don't know what you're saying. I just asked you for a hammer but I don't know what you're saying to me. They, they didn't understand one another anymore. And so they had the tongue mystery brought upon them. Now, perhaps it's important for us to consider why God was not pleased with them being there and, and building this. And some have speculated on the purpose of the tower, whether it was to protect them from a, another flood to come, whether it was an attempt to reach out to God, maybe it was an attempt at pagan worship, maybe it was to make themselves equal to God, all kinds of speculation on why. I don't know why they built the tower. The best that the text tells us is that they just wanted to stay together in that place. 
Uh, and, and that's all that, that we have. But what we do know is that staying together to build this tower was not according to God's commandment. It doesn't matter why we disobey God. What matters is what God said. And so here's what the Lord said to the people in Genesis chapter 8 at verse 17, and again chapter 9 verse 1 and verse 7, Be fruitful and multiply on the earth. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. That's not that hard to understand. God said, go and fill the earth. He said it multiple times. And yet there they are staying in, in Shinar and building this tower. In chapter 11 and at verse 4, this is what the people said. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. God said, go and be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. We want to stay here. We want to stay in this place, lest we be scattered. Verse 8 and 9, it says, so the Lord scattered them. The Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth. Therefore, its name is called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Therefore its name is called Babel. The Hebrew word, as I understand it, literally means confusion. We've already looked at a word for confusion. That was the tongue mystery that happened. It says its name was called Babel. The Lord confused their languages and scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. Well, let's look at the Chinese word for Babel. The Chinese word for Babel doesn't deal with the confusion. It actually deals with, with God's will being implemented. This word means to greatly separate or the desired departure. God had told them multiple times His will was that they scatter throughout the whole earth. That they be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, and they didn't do that. And so when the Chinese people were writing their language and embedding the, the early history, when it came to the word Babel, they talked about that separation that took place. That the folks there were greatly separated or that it was the desired departure that God had spoken about. The word for separate or depart breaks down a little bit further. What it tells us is that man's power or capability was cut. They were going to make a name for themselves. They were going to build this tower and its, its height was going to be up in the heavens. Remember what God said? Nothing that they propose to do shall be withheld from them, but let's go down and scatter them. Let's confuse their language. In doing so, God cut man's power. The tower project came to a screeching halt, and everybody went their separate ways. From Babel, the Lord scattered the people. Here is a Chinese image for scatter. And it just simply tells us that all flesh would go or would follow. They're not going to stay there anymore. They went this way, they went that way. They left the plain of Shinar and they populated the earth as God had planned. We might say that they were migrating. Here's an image for migrate. There's two of them that we're going to look at. This one is more of a generic image. This one talks about Walking thousands, or thousands walking. Take it whichever way you want to. Walking thousands, talking about how far they went. Or thousands walking, talking about how many went. Both are true. But there's a more detailed image for migrate. One that I believe is specifically about the Chinese people. Inside this image for migrate, what we see is that there was a great walk from the west and that they would eventually stop in the land we today call China. Let's map it out. They didn't walk west, they walked from the west. And they walked from the region where Babel was in what today we would call Iraq. And they made their way to China. But there's more to this image that tells us about their migration. I'm not 
convinced in that image that what they're saying is they left Babel. I don't think that's what they're pointing to. Remember in lesson one, we saw the word necessary. This word pictures one man who is in the garden enclosure and he needs a woman. And when we noted this image, I pointed out to you that the word west is in there. And so keep that in mind for lesson five. This is lesson five. I don't believe that they're pointing back to Babel, which is where they departed from and went off to China. But rather, they're pointing back to where Adam and Eve were. Because the first occurrence of this image, one man and enclosure, is inside the word for necessary, which talks about Adam being in the garden and needing a woman. Now, we're not going to pinpoint from that exactly where the Garden of Eden was. But that seems to be what they're pointing to. Not to Babel, but to where the one man was inside the enclosure. So here's the question. How did the ancient Chinese people know all this stuff? They've got all kinds of pre-Babel history embedded into their language, and they had it there 750 years before Moses was writing the book of Genesis. So how did they get there? They tell us. They use a couple words to tell us. This is an image for to tell or to speak. They say that it came from, oh, these are the words from eight elders. Words from eight elders. I wonder who that might be. The last time that we saw eight people, it was Noah and Mrs. Noah, Ham, Sham, and Japheth, and Mrs. Ham, Sham, and Japheth. Who are the eight oldest people on the planet at that time? That would be them. Words from eight elders. Now, just in case we are still in doubt about this, they actually tell us a little bit more. They have an image that means to hand down or to pass something down. And again, what they're telling us in this is their source. You've been here all the way through since Sunday. You recognize every part of that image. This is eight water people. So we've got words from eight elders, and uh, we don't know who those eight elders are. They're the eight water people. Who would you describe back around 2200 B.C. as eight water people? That sure sounds like the people who got off the ark. That's their source. Something else for you to think about. Genesis chapter 10, we're not going to spend a great deal of time there just simply because of the nature of the chapter. But I do want you to think about this. We know where Shem, Ham, and Japheth went and where their descendants went. Genesis 10 tells us the sons of Japheth were and then tells us from the coastland peoples and the gent, uh, of the Gentiles, they were separated into their lands. The sons of Ham were and then it tells us who they were and the land of Shinar and Assyria and Philistia and so forth. And, and the sons of Shem were these and, and tells us where they were. We can go in Genesis 10 and we can map out where all the sons of Noah went. Here's my question. Where'd Noah go? Because Genesis 10 doesn't tell us where Noah went. All it says is where his sons and their descendants went. It doesn't say where Noah went. In Genesis 9 and at verse 28 it says, Noah lived after the flood 350 years. Now remember on Sunday morning we were using James Usher's time chart of Bible history. And Usher places the Tower of Babel 101 years after the, the flood. So that means we still have 249 years of Moses' life that's unaccounted for. And so again, my question is, where did Noah go? In a previous lesson, we looked at Noah 
So we talked about his name. Remember, Noah is identified as the second approved of a second promise. Second approved, uh, the first approved was Enoch, his great grandfather. He said, had it said of him that he walked with God. And the second and only other person to have that said of them in Scripture is Noah. He was the second approved. He's the second promise because the first promise was in Genesis chapter 3, the seed of woman would defeat the seed of the serpent. The second promise is at the end of Genesis chapter 5. Lamech, who is Noah's father, he's the one who proclaims the promise. As he's naming Noah, he says, through this one we will find comfort from the land which God has cursed. Over in chapter 8, verse 28 and 29, we find that the, the curse was lifted, the weeds curse that was upon the land. And so he's the second promise or the second approved. But the Chinese people actually have a second way that they write Noah's name. This is the second way that you write Noah. The image could mean move to second. I guess if Noah was an avid baseball player, then maybe that might make sense. But I'm not sure what else would work there. So maybe we'll not go with second. That image can also mean inferior, but that doesn't make good sense. Move to inferior. Does anyone remember what that image can mean in addition to second and inferior? Move to Asia. They say of, no of Noah, he moved to Asia. Well, where's Asia? Where's China? It's part of Asia. They're telling us that they know about these eight people who got off a boat. That the words from eight elders is their source. That these eight elders are eight water people and that they know this one in particular because he moved to Asia with them. This isn't me suggesting it. This is the ancient Chinese people saying it. They embedded it in their language. He moved to Asia. In the course of my research, I've come across some who have claimed that Noah might have been the first emperor of China. I won't make that claim. I'll just put it out there. That it's possible. The oldest man on earth, a man who is a prophet of God, and he goes there with them, he might make a good emperor. At the very least, I believe that Noah was involved in putting together the language and in making sure that this record was recorded, embedded into the language. It may be he's the one who is going to the north border and sacrificing to Shangdi, who is Shaddai and quoting the very things that Noah would write in Genesis chapter 1. I guess he wasn't quoting it. He was saying it before. That's their source. So we've looked at the Genesis story from creation through the Tower of Babel, and we've looked at 95 Chinese characters that give us express detail about these events in their etymology. There's more. I wish I could show you more. I know there's more. It's still to be discovered. I think I've mentioned this is a rather tedious process to do Chinese etymology, especially for some guy who doesn't read or write Chinese. And so it takes time to find these images and to go through them. Remember I told you of the word for promise. There's 16 words for promise in the Chinese language. Fortunately, they already put it in, into his name, and so we didn't have to go searching for it. But with a lot of the images, there's a number of different images for the same word. And so it's, it's a time-consuming process. But I'm confident that there is so much more to be discovered. You might be thinking, well, oh, that was really neat stuff. What was the point of it? Come back tomorrow night. We're going to talk about that tomorrow night. Why did we just spend the last several days looking at a bunch of Chinese characters? 
You know, the first time I was introduced to this material, and it was 20 characters given to me by Chuck Bartlett, I looked at it and I thought, wow, that's really neat. And then I threw it on a shelf and forgot about it for almost 10 years. It's not on a shelf anymore. I use it quite regularly. I'm asked to show this presentation quite regularly. Why are people wanting that? And so we're going to talk about that tomorrow night. As we studied tonight, we studied about a division that took place. God separated the people from the Tower of Babel into their respective nations. But there's a day coming when God is going to gather all those nations back together. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew, the 25th chapter, beginning at verse 31. He says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And He will set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on His left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from before the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord... When did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. <clears throat> there is a day coming when the Lord is going to gather the nations together again. It is judgment. The text tells us on that day He's going to separate them again, but not according to their nations, but according to whether they did His will or not. We want to be in the sheep. We want to be those who are on the right hand of Christ, who have done His will, who have served Him and have served our fellow man. He tells us the end result. He says those who are on the left, those who did not serve, those who did not obey, He says they will go into everlasting punishment. Those on the right hand, He says into eternal life. <coughs> the great thing about it is, you and I get to choose whether we're a sheep or a goat. You and I get to choose whether we'll obey what God says for us to do, whether we'll serve Him in this life, or serve ourselves in this life. We get to determine our own eternity. Have you considered your eternity? Have you obeyed what God says do to be a child of His? Jesus tells us that we need to believe who He is, that He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He tells us that we need to turn away from sin. He says we need to confess Him before men and be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. Friend, if you have not done that, then you are not a sheep. You remain a goat. And you will be cast into everlasting destruction. If you have done that and have turned away, 
then you're not a sheep. You're a goat. We need to become a child of God and serve Him faithfully. Faithful to the end. And if we'll do so, then He'll receive us into His kingdom and give us a crown of life. You are subject to the invitation. Do not leave this building tonight without being sure you're ready to meet your Maker. Lord willing, we come again tomorrow night. Lord willing. But we don't know that we have that time. So take this time. If you're subject to the invitation, let us know as we stand together and sing.